Hi, and welcome to Hypnotize Me, the podcast about hypnosis, transformation, and healing. This is Dr. Elizabeth Bonet, and I'm your host. This podcast is not a substitute for mental health treatment, nor should it be. If you need therapy or hypnotherapy, please seek a trained professional. I do hypnosis all over the world, so if you'd like to learn more about me, you can do that at my website, drlizhypnosis.com. That's D-R-L-I-Z hypnosis.com. Now on to our episode. Welcome to Hypnotize Me. This is your host, Dr. Liz. Before we get started, I want to let you know that the studio recorded hypnosis files are almost ready. I'm so excited about them. The free ones are actually already up. So if you haven't joined the newsletter yet, go ahead and do that and get the free hypnosis files. They sound amazing. You can just text the word hypnotize to 444-999. And you'll be on the newsletter and get all kinds of tips and announcements when new episodes air and you'll get the free hypnosis files. So that's the word hypnotize to 444-999. It's completely free. I also wanted to say thank you for a review from Time is on my side again. That's a great username, right? (laughs) They say, Dr. Liz keeps me informed in so many ways. I look forward to each episode she offers. I'm always striving to learn and evolve. By listening to Dr. Liz, I've learned to tune into my body, intuition, and express the feelings that come to mind. She's funny, warm, informative, and personable. She's eager to learn from others and share her knowledge with others without wanting something in return. Thank you, Dr. Liz. So thank you so much for time is on my side again. That was really sweet. And I was so happy to see it. I get reviews from time to time, but they're not like a daily thing. So when one pops in, I'm always happy to see it. And it's easy to do if you would like to leave me a review as well. If you go to the show notes, it shows you the steps right there. Or you can do it from the website when you go and listen to an episode on the website. But I think the easiest way to do it is generally on your phone. This week's episode is with Freya Norton. It is marked explicit. The whole episode is about sex. So if you have little ears in the car that you don't feel it's appropriate to hear about this stuff, you may want to come back and listen to this episode later. Freya is an intimacy educator, a master hypnotist, and a massage therapist. And she's been working with the mind-body connection and sensuality for the last 13 years I did ask Freya to talk about what she typically sees in her office. So this interview is oriented towards heterosexual couples, male, female. We talk about why it's hard for women to communicate during sex, strategies to overcome that, what teching is and how it helps improve your sex life, how hypnosis helps people have better sex. She talks about that in terms of women being able to enter their own hypnotic trance, as well as erectile dysfunction and how hypnosis can help with that as well. So I hope you enjoy all the information in it or that it helps you or someone you know. Let's jump in. Peace, everyone. Have a peaceful week. Hi, Freya. Welcome to the Hypnotize Me podcast. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm happy you're here. So I was looking at your bio and I noticed that you trained with Mike Mendel. Yes. Okay. I listen to their podcast actually um, from time to time. They have a wonderful hip- hypnosis podcast all about hypnosis and um, hypnotic techniques. I wouldn't say it's just hypnosis. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How is the training? I've actually considered attending, like flying up to Toronto. The training is amazing. Um, it teaches you how to do hypnosis. It's a, If you want to know how to be a hypnotist, then it's, it's one of the best out there. Mm-hmm. And I'm partial because I trained with them, but I've also done a lot of other trainings, and I absolutely love it. It's a life-changing week, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, 100%. Wonderful. So how did you begin to specialize in sexual relationships, let's say? Let's go back to when I was a massage therapist. And um, 
first of all, my personal interest, like in life, uh, was always sexuality. I was always obsessed with it and interested it in it from all different perspectives. And I was a massage therapist and my clients would always tell me their personal stuff on the table. And I would be like, well, because I had done a lot of research and reading, why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? And they would go home and then report back to me. And I really, really believed in the power of touch to heal Mm -hmm. and also felt like touch could be healing in terms of sensuality as well. And I started to experiment with tantric touch and with energetic touch and energetic sexual touch. And uh, it was a natural progression from there. Hypnosis came into it because I wanted, like I I knew how much the mind affected the body, Mm -hmm. both in terms of pain, you know, for pain relief for my massage therapy clients, but also in terms of sexuality. Mm. So... I wanted a way to affect, to have a more powerful effect. And that's where I got into hypnosis so that I could do more. Oh, okay. Interesting. So then do you still do massage or do you now just focus on hypnosis? No, I do a lot of massage. Actually, I have a few clients that I, okay. So the deep tissue massage is a lot of work Yes. and there's a few people that I will still let have deep tissue massages because it actually is really interesting. Um, but with the work that I do in sexuality, a lot of it is hands-on. So I'll do a combination of both hands-on and hypnosis together. So like somatic body work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with, with Jaya at all. Yeah, I am. Okay. I just had her on the podcast a couple of... Oh, really? Yes. A couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And um, she talked about a similar process. Yeah, she's actually pretty close to me. We haven't had the chance to meet yet, but we've spoken a few times. And um, yeah, thanks for reminding me. I'm going to have to get together with her. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, she's very nice. I I guess my question around that then is, what kind of problems do you most typically see with, let's say, you know, a mom that comes in, she's had a kid or two or a couple of kids and she's married and what are you seeing show up that could be helpful for this audience, my listeners? All right. I'm going to give a typical situation. So when I speak, I am generalizing and I know that what I'm saying doesn't apply to every person, every relationship and every body, mm-hmm. but this would be very typical. Um, so you've got a woman who comes in and she's got a couple of kids and she's got a husband and her life is pretty overwhelming and she has a lot of responsibility and she has zero desire to have sex with her husband. Mm -hmm. And if they do have sex, then she's not that responsive. So there could be that there just is no responsive responsive meaning meaning she doesn't doesn't get turned on. She doesn't get turned on. Okay. She doesn't get turned on by him. And I got to do this for my husband. Even. Yeah. And, and you know what? Part of them, have husbands who touch them in a really crappy way Mm -hmm. and they have not discovered how to change what their husband does. Mm -hmm. The other part has husbands who touch them. um, They they know what to do, Mm -hmm. but they're just not getting turned on by it. Mm. What do you mean by they touch them in a really crappy way? um, In a crappy way, I just mean touch them in a way that's not, that doesn't feel good to the woman. Okay. So do you think part of that is a communication breakdown? Absolutely. Uh, and communication that wasn't even there to begin with because oh, yes. women tend, yep, women okay. tend to endure touch rather than to um, stop it or change it. So in, mm-hmm. if something's happening that doesn't really feel good to them mm-hmm. or feels nah, or, or, or whatever, they will wait it out and hope that it changes or just wait it out till the end and Mm -hmm. And that's it rather than changing it because the emotional, the prospect of changing it is emotionally challenging Ah, to the woman because they don't want to upset their man's ego. So there's some kind of, um, frightening came to mind, but I know that's, that's probably a little too extreme of a word. You know what? It's not extreme because it is frightening to think about upsetting your partner and women will blame the men for it. And women will say that, oh, you know, he is, 
he's not open to changing, or if I say anything, he gets really defensive. Mm -hmm. That may be the case, but the fact of the matter is that she can't tolerate his discomfort with sexual guidance or criticism or those sexual conversations where he needs to change. So it's her being unable to handle his discomfort with it, Mm -hmm. and she's blaming him for that. Okay. I, I get that. Is it what's coming to mind is I had a man tell me once it was a friend and I was asking him for some advice about something that I, a boyfriend I had at the time that he was doing. I was like, I don't like this. Like, you know, what do, how do I tell him that? And he said to me, you can never tell him that. And I was like, what? <laughs> he directly said <laughs> like, no, you cannot tell him. And I'm like, well, what do I do then? You know? And I don't, I don't even remember what he said, but it was so interesting that it was like a direct message, you know, like, no, 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 you can't. And you're saying that's, it's, um, it's not always that direct. In fact, that's the only person in my life who's been that direct about it, but it's a thing. Well, it's, it's, that's also, yeah, that's, we'll see. That's a reflection. See, I don't know what that thing was, Yeah, but that's a reflection of his oh, opinion as well, right? Absolutely, it was him. Like his yeah. own ego is is really what he was yeah. thinking about. But it's like that message that gets to us as women of like, oh, no, no, you can't say this, you know? Yeah. The thing is, there's a way to communicate uh, sexually and that is helpful okay. and a way that's not helpful. And part of it, a lot of it depends on the man too. Some men are never, ever going to be able to receive that because they're so defensive. Uh-huh. But but there's usually a way to tactfully help them learn. And some of them are like, oh my God, teach me, teach me, teach me. Other ones, you need to be a little more careful. And sometimes that's where I come into play because the woman thinks she's being really obvious. She says, well, I ask him all the time to slow down. Uh She doesn't really. She thinks she is, but he has no idea what she means. And if she says slow down, Again, what does slow down even mean? What does it mean? Well, that depends on the woman and what's happening. How does a man know what slow down means? Mm -hmm. Slow down, maybe he thinks it means for 30 seconds, (laughs) touch her a little bit less, you know, frantically. But, you know, 30 seconds isn't much when it comes to um, sexual pleasure. So this whole communication thing um, is, is a major, major, major issue. And women are not communicating in a way that men can hear. Mm, Okay. So part of your work is to say, okay, let's communicate in a way that your partner can hear. And then part of the work I'm imagining is, is directly teaching, like, how do you, how do you touch where it feels good to her? Okay. There's, I'm going to go with the touch part first, and then I'm going to go into the desire part because that's a really hot topic. And it's something that I'm extremely passionate about. Because so many people get it wrong and okay. like popular literature gets it wrong. Like every, everybody gets it wrong except Esther Perel. Oh, yeah, Esther <laughs> she gets, fantastic. She's so yeah. amazing. She's she just, is. oh, she's a goddess. Uh-huh. So with the touch thing, often women don't even know what their bodies are capable of and they don't know what their body's like. Okay. And they don't know how to communicate. Yes, do this. Yes, do that. And put it into words where somebody else can follow those instructions. So the interview dropped here and we had to reconnect and then start it again. So this is why it sounds like she just jumps into this explanation. But she's talking about how she works with a couple in her office with one person on the massage table and then she's assisting the other person. The woman would be on the massage table and I would be on one side and her partner would be on the other and I would actually show hands-on. So I would demonstrate and he would repeat. And also we would get feedback from the woman and we would kind of work on the language. So if she likes something, how does she say to him that she wants him to continue doing that? For okay. example. Okay. And because Can you give a lot an of times, example like, of that? Yeah, yeah. So with woman's pleasure or with kinesthetic, the physical pathways, pleasure is slow. Mm-hmm. And Our bodies like consistent touch until we don't anymore and we want it to change. 
which is very vague. And it yes, means that yeah, when yeah. you're touching a woman, you have to pay attention to that because something feels perfect. So just to say a, a specific touch on the nipple, um, you know, two seconds of it is not enough for us to actually respond to it. Mm-hmm. Yet to a man, often um, he's very visual and the visual pathways are really, really fast, almost instant, which is why when you look at porn, it's flash, 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 image, image, image. It just changes really quickly. Okay. And his brain responds to that by becoming aroused. Mm -hmm. But when you're becoming aroused, so he, he can get really turned on. And if he does a quick movement that would tell his body, hey, it's time to ejaculate, then he can come and and, and that's good. Mm -hmm. But a woman's body doesn't work that way. And when you arouse somebody through the physical pathways, you have to go slow. So let's come back to the touch. So he's touching Mm -hmm. and in his brain, touching for a few seconds is enough to turn on the nipple. It's not. You have to touch actually for a while for her body and brain to relax into that sensation and start to become aroused by it. Mm. So you have to keep touching and keep touching Mm -hmm. until she reaches that point of diminishing returns. And then the touch has to change. And usually when a, or often when a patient guy kind of gets the hang of it and realizes, okay, I got to, I got to stay on one spot. Mm -hmm. That sort of point of diminishing returns is lost. So maybe he doesn't, maybe she doesn't communicate, you know, I would like something else now, Mm -hmm. either by gesture or by saying it. Mm -hmm. And then he continues to touch it until she gets a noise and loses all of her arousal. So kind of getting into that and learning how to communicate. (laughs) Yeah, you've been there. (laughs) Totally. Yes. Like, would you stop doing that, please? (laughs) Let's move on. But you know what, though? But even, but that, would you stop doing that? It could have been the perfect touch. For several minutes, oh, but yeah, then it has absolutely. to change. But yeah, it's so like that what change you're thing, it's is really, it? really important to know how to communicate that without offending anybody, yes. either yourself or the other person. Yes, yeah, I'm laughing because it's making intuitive sense. I think yeah. probably most of us have been there. Mm-hmm. And it is hard to say in the moment. It's really hard. It's so hard to like say. Like, I would in the never moment. say it like that. You know, you yeah. never be like, just, just freak and move on, you know? Because, because also arousal. <laughs> Well, at least for me and, and for a lot of people, arousal makes you less verbal. It makes – I lose my words, mm, yes. my actual okay. speech I words. I a lot so, of women do. Yeah. 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 So the thought of having to – so you're in your body and you're focused and you're really in the moment trying to formulate actual words mm-hmm. is difficult because now you have to get out of your body and get back into your thinking brain again. And with sexuality, if you really, really want a woman to be aroused, she has to get out of her thinking brain so is and be in her body. I have a question about that. Yeah, is that yeah. also, it, I'm assuming it varies with someone's sexual template because there's a lot of people who like to like talk dirty, right? That's words. And for them, they're good at it. So they're it's better. Easy. They're at, better. They're better at verbalizing. At verbalizing or even yeah. saying, hey, do this yeah. or do that or move yeah. or, you know, move on, mm-hmm. like whatever that is in, you know, sexy talk, let's say. See, their difficulty would be in um, feeling uncomfortable saying move on. They, they're they comfortable running verbal dialogues that mm-hmm. turn them on, mm-hmm. but they may not be comfortable giving instructions. Ah, okay. So it's still this barrier sometimes in terms yeah. of giving instructions. And the barrier really, it, it's a psychological barrier. And when both people realize that they're on the same page, it's it's a lot easier I will get people to do what I call, I call it teching. And and they take 15 minutes to half an hour to an hour to whatever. It depends on the person. But give it a set time period where you take that 15 minutes and you, in a really methodical way, this is not sexy time. This is, hey, let's go over your body and discover every touch and how you like it and how you don't like it. Mm, every single okay. one every so single separate way from, from like sexual yeah, totally separate because it gives you the chance to have conversation about it without feeling that vulnerability of when you're aroused or when you're trying to arouse the other person mm-hmm. because if you're not trying to do something sexy then there's no pressure 
Mm-hmm. And you can, for example, try every different stroke, try different positions without feeling silly. Mm-hmm. You can keep your clothes on if some positions make you feel uncomfortable in the light of day. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> you can fall and laugh about it and, and not feel like an idiot. Mm-hmm. So this practice session where you learn each other's bodies and learn how to say, because he can say, well, how would you tell me that? So if you like this touch and you want it to change to this, because as you get more aroused, you you like it to move from gentle grazing over your vulva to me actually pressing Mm -hmm. on your clit and not really moving it, just kind of pressing and pulsing. How would you show, show me that you want that? And she can say, well, you know, when I, like if I kind of go like this, <laughs> you uh-huh. know, yeah. so she can give him the cues and he knows, okay, when she does that, I know what to do. Ah, fascinating. And then during sex, if he misses it, she can be like, here's that time where you can do what I showed you. Uh-huh. And it's not uncomfortable. It's like, oh yeah. Mm. It increases trust. It increases the fun and it takes away a lot of the sort of uh, threat. Mm-hmm. That's there in sex? Yeah, right. I can see that. For both sides. For both sides. Because hmm. there's a lot of vulnerability when you really care about the person and your ego is invested in them feeling good. Mm-hmm. Yes. Which is why it's difficult for men because their identity is invested in being able to pleasure a woman. And when they can't, it hits them hard. Mm, okay. Okay. So then that's, that's um, helping them feel better about it. Yeah. And helping the woman feel better. Yeah, very much so. And, and giving her a little more control over her sexuality instead of thinking, oh, it's all out of my hands. Yeah, it's, it's all, all oh, what somebody's to doing me. to me. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I'll just say the big, a big thing for a woman to learn is self-trance, how to get into that zone, how to get into that state of receptivity where they're not thinking about the kids and the laundry and Mm -hmm. her husband's dirty underwear and socks on the floor and how annoying he is in the, and like the toothpaste that he left on the bathroom counter. (laughs) So because when she's, when she's thinking about that, she cannot get aroused. She has to get into the zone, Mm -hmm. basically go into self hypnosis, a trance where her focus is really on her body and her pleasure. So part of what you're teaching is how do you get into that state? Yeah. And that's hypnosis. That's where the hypnosis comes in. Uh Yeah. How do you, how do you teach them to get to that state? Oh, we do it. You do. We actually do. Yeah. We we do trance formally Mm -hmm. and then we help them get there quickly and create a ritual where they're going to be able to get there no matter what. And a nice ritual for getting into that receptive sensual trance is actually cuddling Mm. so you know so you know it's the evening you've gotten the kids to bed it's kind of stressful usually you have a million things to do and and those things don't end when you go to bed and you're Mm -hmm. not feeling sexy Mm -hmm. and you're not wanting to jump your partner's bones Mm -hmm. like you're just not as a married woman with kids so you get to bed And you're not in that state. So if he starts poking you, you're like, God, go to bed. Mm -hmm. Like, like, I'd rather just scroll through my phone than touch you. And (laughs) (laughs) so so getting into, so if you cuddle and that cuddling without pressure, and that's 100% has to be, there's no guarantee. It's not like you're saying by cuddling, okay, I'm going to have sex with you. Otherwise, you're not going to want to cuddle. So you cuddle. And you relax your body, relax your mind, and tune in to the wonderful sensation of having your bodies pressed together. And actually, that's quite a sensual sensation. And once you've actually relaxed out of that fight or flight sort of on mode of being mom, and now you've relaxed and there's really nothing on your mind, and actually your partner's body feels really good, feels nice against you. Mm -hmm. And from that relaxation, the gentle touch, the caressing, the sort of like nuzzling on the neck and kissing is wanted and it feels yummy. And you can begin to respond to it by wanting more of that pleasure. Mm. Then the more of the pleasure is what leads to arousal. 
then the arousal leads to desire. See, most people have that concept in married sex. I'm calling it married sex versus, you know, an affair or versus new relationship sex. It's totally different. But in long-term relationships, relationships. Mm -hmm. this is the unsexy truth, but it's the truth. And it doesn't have to be bad because actually the sex is way better. But anyway, it starts with relaxation. It moves to pleasure. Then it's arousal. The arousal is what creates the desire. So desire is actually fourth. It's not you have the desire first. It's not like you're walking around horny for your partner, which is often different with men because men have a different physiology. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, and do you think this varies by template as well? Like there, there are some women who like to just jump right into it or they do walk around thinking about their partner versus you know, some women who are like, no, I absolutely need that cuddle time. And men as well, like, you know. Yeah, but the women who are walking around wanting to jump their partner's bones and then just getting right into it aren't the ones who are looking for assistance with their libido or with sexuality in their marriage. (laughs) True. (laughs) In general, true. So it's, it's, you know, it doesn't matter. It's a moot point for those people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And So you're saying the people that show up for help are generally have more of this template that the, yeah, that yeah. arousal comes forth instead of first. Yeah. And there are a lot of studies that say it's not that women have lower libidos than men. Mm-hmm. It's that women's libidos drop dramatically once they commit to a monogamous relationship. Okay. And it's not that they don't want sex. They just don't want the sex that they can have. So that's Meaning? a whole nother subject. <laughs> yeah, right. I was it's like, a uh, that's subject. a really interesting sentence that I can't let go. It, it's a it's a really, really interesting sentence. And throughout history, um, men have had license to think about and act upon this sort of, you know, the promiscuous ape kind of concept. Mm-hmm. Women have not because it was very dangerous for us. We would be killed, beaten. We would lose everything, lose our families, lose our community. So it hasn't been safe for women to express their sexuality in that way. Mm -hmm. And even today, when that doesn't happen to us in the Western world, a lot of times, well, no, some actually there's a lot of slut shaming, but uh, we still monogamy is still what people think of as the norm. Yes, it can become very like people do have affairs and then lose their children and their their husband and their their whole lives. They actually, yeah. Or you get into a volatile situation. It can be life threatening. Actually, if it, you know, it really can. When you you look at um, even domestic violence rates, it's often sometimes. Yes. Yeah. So lover. it makes sense to choose it over choosing the risks of pursuing sexual excitement. Mm-hmm. But I'm not talking about this mating superficial sexual excitement right now. I'm talking Mm -hmm. about the desire that's brought on by intense pleasure, which is a sort of deeper, more conscious way to keep on connecting long-term because Mm -hmm. in long-term relationships, the desire goes down. Mm -hmm. It's not a, it's not an insult. It's a biological fact. Mm Mm-hmm. So this is a way to enjoy really, really, really beautiful, super hot sex without needing that desire to come first. Mm -hmm. And hypnosis helps. Okay. So you're saying like, we know that over time, long-term relationships that, you know, initial desire that like yearning for each other that was there in the beginning fades. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and most, because, most people know this. Yeah, <laughs> and, like it just fades. Every and if time. you think about it, yearning comes from not having. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you meet somebody and you want them so badly, and you don't have them, which stimulates more of that wanting. And once you have them, you own them, you domesticate them. Now you're living together twenty four seven. You don't need to want them anymore. You already have them. Okay. But just from a brain chemical standpoint, 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Like you're saying just from like a, yeah, evolutionary standpoint, you're saying yeah. this is what happens. Yes. Okay. But to create that desire, then it becomes a deeper process. If you want to create the desire of a new relationship, that's a different story altogether. And it involves a lot of acrobatics and techniques and different things. I didn't mean of a new relationship. Yeah. I'm just saying, like using your terminology to create desire um, as a, as the fourth step, right? Like the arousal. Yes. Or- oh, that, yeah. And that, yeah, that is a really great way to enjoy desire. Mm-hmm. Because even it when up, your lifestyle doesn't promote it. Yeah, it comes up in the moment. Yeah. And, and again, this is in no way, it's not saying that there's anything wrong with it. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with there not being a lot of sexual desire when your lifestyle is such that you have tons of responsibility, you've got a couple of kids. Look, they're taking your energy. Mm-hmm. And that's what they should be doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. what kids do. So right. there's nothing wrong with that. And there's also nothing wrong with not having act like walking around with active desire and active wanting, but it's nice to connect with your partner and it's nice to enjoy really profound sexual experiences with your partner. So you create them. Yes. Okay. Instead of them happening automatically. Cause it doesn't happen automatically. You have to make it happen. Got it. Got it. And, and it's not putting on lingerie and taking a bath. It goes a little bit uh-huh. deeper than that psychologically. Uh huh. Do you think in our the the Western culture we're living in today, sometimes this image is portrayed that like, oh, take the bubble bath and put on the lingerie and everything will be fine. Oh, very much so. Okay, and even like long term couples are having like fantastic sex, and somehow like there's something wrong with you over here. Everybody, everybody thinks that everybody else is having more sex and better sex. I do think that our culture is primarily um, financially driven and marketing driven. Yes. So if people feel like something's wrong with them, then they'll buy stuff in order to feel better. Mm -hmm. From a marketing perspective, if a woman and a man, if all they need to reconnect is to actually put a few more hours into doing it, Mm -hmm. then nobody makes any money. Yeah. The companies and what the media is basically all about selling stuff. So they're going to sell you Viagra. They're going to sell you uh, lingerie, Mm -hmm. all kinds of beauty products, bath products. They're going to sell you weekends away. And actually, a change of environment is nice, but it's not feasible to do every weekend. Yeah. They're going to sell you everything that they can sell you because you want a feeling. You want this feeling of satisfaction and you think, oh my God, maybe if I buy something, I can get it. The satisfaction is not going to come from that. It's going to come from taking the time and the effort and the energy to connect on a level where you create those brain chemicals of closeness, of love, and of satisfaction and intense pleasure, all of those things together, and you don't have to buy anything. Yes, yes. But it is effort. And what do we do 24-7? We scroll through our phones wanting something to be given to us automatically and instantly. But just like building strength in your body, you have to actually put in the work of lifting the weight and you have to put in the work sexually too. Mm -hmm. It can't happen instantly. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Viagra. Yeah. um, If someone is having like erectile dysfunction problems, how do you work with them in terms of hypnosis? Like, do you think it's effective for that? Do you? Yeah. Yeah. You do? Very much so. Yeah. Okay. Most erectile dysfunction is in the mind. It's created by your brain rather than being a physical problem. That being said, there are things that will interrupt it physically. So if somebody has diabetes Mm -hmm. and if somebody has prostate issues or is on medications and there's tons of medications that cause problems with your erections and the doctors won't tell you. Mm -hmm. So that's a big thing. If you're on blood pressure medication, depression medication, if you're on um, heart medication, all kinds of medications, prostate medications, uh, they're going to cause that. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind. If you're on any kind of medication that could be causing an erect, 
an erectile problem. Yes. A second cause of it is your masturbation habits. Okay. That's a big one. Mm-hmm. And the biggest cause is actually anxiety. Okay. Masturbation habits yeah. meaning like too much? Meaning, yes, too much what you're looking at. Okay. Meaning um, excessive porn Ex- use uh-huh. and also excessive, um, like if you're too rough mm-hmm. and you're using a vice grip and you're looking at pornography often, mm-hmm. then what you're doing is conditioning your body and conditioning your mind to need that specific stimulation. Mm. So without it, your penis is not going to work. So it's like, you know, be careful in that area. Oh, you know what? You have to think of your sexuality as a practice. Mm-hmm. Just like you have a health practice, you have, uh, you know, everything in your life is feeding your brain and telling you how to respond to the environment around you. So mm-hmm. everything that you do sexually affects you. Okay. Everything mm-hmm. from what you're, what you fantasize about, what you look at, what you do to your body, and you can, you can manipulate it, which is nice. So if your body's not responding the way that you want, then, you know, what are you, what are you doing mm-hmm. to create that state in your body? And what mm-hmm. can you do to change it? And I'm not saying anything is good or bad, mm-hmm. but if you're not responding the way that you want, maybe you're doing something to contribute to that. Okay. Got it. All right. And the anxiety one is the biggest one. Mm-hmm. What a guy thinks about in his head as he's having sex, once he kind of gets that into that cycle of um, worry, Mm-hmm. then it's going to go limp. Okay. When someone shows up in your office for that type of work, are you teaching a hypnotic trance to reduce the anxiety to like, what are you, what are you doing with them? In an easy case? Yeah. Let's say like medically he's been checked out and there's nothing wrong medically. So the doctor's All I like, do is teach there's nothing wrong with you. How to chill out. So that his thought process mm-hmm is one that is conducive to erections rather than one that isn't. Uh-huh. That's it. And it's that easy. You, you just control what your brain is doing. And in more complicated processes, maybe they need to go back and heal sensitizing events. Like something may have happened mm-hmm. to him, either as a child or in an early sexual experience, maybe, or actually, this is really common, um, with men who have been cheated on mm-hmm. and then they divorce and now he's out in the dating field again, mm-hmm. something about that betrayal and what it did to his ego and his mind and his heart uh, will really, really affect his erection. Not every time, but it's a common one. Fascinating. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's yeah. great. And you're saying part of um, him getting over that is, is doing some of that psychological work. Like- doing some of the healing work, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. going back, healing the trauma, and forgiving and forgiving doesn't mean condoning mm-hmm. forgiving is letting yourself off the hook right and yeah. and releasing releasing holding on what somebody else did to you so you're saying sometimes that's affecting holding Massively. on to the anger holding on to the hurt to work Hol- yeah holding on to it mm-hmm. even though the relationship technically is done like that you know the divorce has happened the person's dating again it's all those feelings yep. they're holding on yep. to because when a man is cheated on Just like a woman, you know, we don't have rational feelings towards a betrayal. Oh, yeah. No, not at all. We tend to internal, we give it these meanings Mm -hmm. that generally will will relate to being unworthy in some way. And that feeling of unworthiness will mess with future um, interactions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And for women on that side, let's say a woman that's been cheated on, and then do you also see like arousal problems related to that? Like it's a trust issue going on? There are trust issues. Um, But what I see more with women is they'll blame something like their bodies. It will manifest more in body image issues and feeling like uh, they cannot, it's almost like their body isn't deserving of being, I'm going to use this term, worshipped or honored Mm -hmm. centrally and sexually because it doesn't look a certain way. Mm. So they kind of, you know, they internalize these fake things. It's it's not about how you look. Like if some, if you're betrayed, it's, it has nothing to do with it. Yeah. Yeah, So, but they'll make it that way because those are the pervasive beliefs in our society. You know, if I, if I can only, um, 
look pretty enough or young enough or if I can mm-hmm. do enough sexual acrobatics. That's not true. It has nothing to do with why somebody would. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of research on that for the people listening out there, my listeners. There is a lot of research on that. And that is often the first thing that a woman will jump to. It's like, oh, I wasn't this, this, or this on the outside. Our sexuality too. We don't have that penis out on display. Mm -hmm. So if our mind falters during sexuality, nobody knows except us. Mm -hmm. And with the guy, if his falters, then it shows on the outside. It's like right there. Yeah. So there's no fudging it. And that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, true. Well, it has been a really interesting conversation and we're coming to the end of our time. All right. Uh, Can you please let people know how to find you? Yeah, uh, I can be gotten a hold of on thesensualist.org. And you can also find me on Facebook as Freya Norden. That's F-R-E-J-A-N-J-O-R-D-E-N. And I'm happy for you to get in touch with me. Hey, fantastic. Do you do work all over the world? Do you do phone sessions? I do. I will, do? Yeah. Okay. I will do distance sessions. Some things I think um, they should be in person. Mm-hmm. And other things are fine by distance. And one thing that works really well, too, is consultations. Because sometimes people just need information. They don't even need therapeutic work. Yeah. They just need the right kind of guidance and information. And they can take that and move forward with it. Absolutely. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Wonderful. So that will be in the show notes for everyone as well so that you can easily find Freya. Great. Thank you very much. It was wonderful speaking to you. Yeah. It was my pleasure. truly enjoying today's episode. Remember that you can get free hypnosis downloads over at my website, drlizhypnosis.com, D-R-L-I-Z hypnosis.com. I work all over the world doing hypnosis. So if you're interested in working with me, please schedule a free consultation over at my website and we'll see what your goals are and if I can be of service to you and helping you reach them. Finally, if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the podcast or tell a friend. That way, more and more people learn about the power of hypnosis. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful week. Peace.